Monday, everyone. Let's get ready to continue. Uh, any questions before I start? What did Core do today? What? <laughs> you are in for a rude day and night. <laughs> Next 10 hours will be a problem. Yes. It sucks. Was it hard? Well, I guess you're not done yet. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Harder or easier than Project 3? Harder. Really? Cool. Was that two hours a day for four weeks? Cool. Yeah, I don't want to do any extensions because then that'll cut into your project five time. Project five is also hard, so just have even less time there. Cool. Your midterms are being midterm twos are being graded. Uh, they should be back quicker than midterm one. We'll see. No promises. I don't want to spoil anything before I have anything to give. Yeah. Nope. I'll tell you about it later, after they're all graded. But I, I can't promise, but I'm highly confident it will be faster grading this time around. And I think it'll be cooler for you guys too. But we'll see. It could also blow up in my face and you won't get them back until the end of the semester. That's, you know, large range of possibilities. You have to be prepared for anything. Cool. Okay, so let's recap. We were looking at on Friday, we were looking at how can we actually simulate call by name when all we have is, uh, sorry, pass by name when all we have is pass by value. So here we have our code where we have an int y. Uh, wait, is this what we mean? Yes. Okay, so this is our original code where we have a function p that takes in an int y. We set a local variable j equal to y. We increment global i, and then we return j plus y. And we have this q function that has a local variable j, and i equals 0, the global i. And then we call p, and we pass in i plus j. And remember, the cool and weird thing and counterintuitive thing about pass by main is that everywhere that y is used, the expression i plus j is going to be substituted there. So in our main function, we just call q. And so we can actually simulate this. So on the left is our pass by main program. But we can get these exact same semantics with pass by value if everywhere, instead of having y, instead of y being an integer, because in pass by value, this will be a separate copy of that integer, we evaluate the expression that was passed in here every time y is used. So that would, in essence, duh. I'm just going to put it all out here. In essence, what that means is we turn this i plus j expression into a function. And here I've done it as a global function. And so the idea is every time this function is called, we compute brand new what's i plus j. This way, so this is what we pass into p. And so p takes in a y parameter, which is a function pointer. And so instead of an int, every time we were going to, going to use y, we will instead call y as a function. So in this way, we can actually compile this, and we can get pass by name semantics to get the same output five, which is what we got on pass by name. Any questions on this part? Cool. So, how many people know Java? Feel like you know it pretty well. Only a third of you raised your hands. I feel like that's highly, very low percentage. Don't you learn Java in your intro? Classes? Yeah. So you've forgotten it since then? <laughs> Haven't used it since then? Yeah. Cool. I don't know how I feel about that, but I guess good. So now that you've learned parameter passing semantics, what is the parameter passing semantics of Java? Pass by reference. Pass by reference? Pass by copy of the reference. <laughs> Pass by copy of the What are reference variables in Java? But do you see any pointers in pointer operations? No, because it's just explicitly yeah. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> yes, like a Facebook relationship status. Yeah. Right? Is it pass by value, pass by reference, or pass by name? And so let's look at an example. So we have a class testing 
with a local, with a field foo. We have a class parameter passing. We have a main method. Jeez, all this stuff just to print something out. Um, we create a new object bar. We create a new object snap. We set bar.foo equal to zero. We set snap.foo equal to 10. We call a function pass by question mark, bar snap, and then we print out bar.foo and snap.foo. So what is pass by question mark? We take some two testing classes, A and B. It's going to set B equal to a new testing. It's going to set B foo equal to 100. And it's going to set A foo equal to 42. So what is this going to print out? Zero forty-two. Forty-two ten. Forty-two ten. Why? A gets changed, but B doesn't effectively. What do you mean A? Or so A and B are local vari are so parameters here. So foo gets changed, but snap doesn't. Foo. Or if the bar gets changed, but snap doesn't. Foo is the field. <laughs> okay, so so bars what gets changed? Uh, instance variables. Yeah, so the field in its class, right? Its member variable, this foo, gets changed. So we set a dot foo equals forty two, right? And then b. So what happens to snap though? There's a new object created. That changes the reference where. So should it print out 100? If we're saying it's passed by reference? Hmm? Because we have called new testing. It should print 10. Because there's a new object defined inside the function. So it's shadowed the earlier function. Why? But if it's passed by reference, then this b, b equals new testing would change snap to be equal to this new object, right? You can't just make up new things. <laughs> you kind of can, actually. So you can see how this is changing our kind of notions about how we talked about pass by value, pass by reference. Is it pass by name? No. No, we can emphatically say no. <laughs> it's definitely not. So what's the problem with this combination here? So why is it not purely pass by value? Well, everything's an object, right? We're passing in an object. We're passing in bar, and yet its field gets changed. So what it is not doing is it is not passing in a new copy, a new value of that object bar, right? So we say, OK, it's not passed by value, but is it passed by reference? Why is it not passed by reference? Because snap doesn't change to this new object that's created. Right? Snap doesn't output 100. Snap.foo is, no, is not 100. Yeah, you have your hand up. Yeah, so it's kind of a weird <coughs> combination of both, right? It is, and that is part of the problem, right? Is how do you explain this to somebody if all they know is Java? So we talked about, yes, it's pointers underneath, but Java doesn't have pointers. So you don't have to learn pointers to learn Java. So how would you explain the semantics of this as, oh, they're just pointers underneath. And it's passed by value, but all the objects are really pointers to objects. And so then it makes sense, because you're passing in a copy of that pointer to that object. And so setting it equal to a new thing doesn't change the original pointer. But altering a field of that pointer, so dereferencing that pointer, does change that object. So the other way to think about this, remember we talked about assignment semantics. What are the assignment semantics of Java? right? And so it's kind of a pass by value and assignment sharing semantics. So here, we're passing it in by value, but we're, um, and this is not standard in uh, terminology. And it's really, uh, when you kind of break it down, this is the problem, I feel, is that when you break it down, it's very clear of what it's doing, right? You're saying, 
These are pointers, and we're copying by value pointers in here. Um, except you have to remember that primitive types are not pointers, they are actual things. So that also throws a wrinkle in this understanding Java and its semantics. Okay, but to go back, I think, to the very first answer, it's complicated, right? It's probably not something you expect to talk about when you talk about Java. You think, oh, it's much simpler than C and C++. But I think in this instance, it definitely is a bit more complicated because you have to do more mental thinking about what does this actually mean. Cool. Let's talk about something crazy. Let's talk about local functions. What do I mean by local functions? Yeah, so, so what, was, what did we learn when we talked about type systems about function? The type system that we used uh, to discuss types and type equivalents and also Hindley Milner type inference. What was the important thing about that type system with respect to functions? Function is a type. Function is a type just like any other type. Right? There's no difference between functions and classes and structs and ints. Right? It's a type just like any other, and so it can be an argument to a function, it can be returned from a function, it can be a field in a structure. So similarly, if we kind of say, okay, we can have global variables in you know, C, C++, we have global variables. We can have local variables, and we have global functions. We have local variables which are only applicable to that function. So why can't we have local functions as well? If you try and think what makes, A, what does make functions so different that they're so limiting as composed to all these other techniques that we're talking about? And so what if we wanted, how would we actually implement a language that allows defining local functions? And what are the challenges here? So the key thing is, these are functions that are only valid in that scope, right? So scoping is pretty easy to deal with. Would you agree with that? Right, we do it just like with variables. It's valid only in that scope. You've all done this, you know how to do this. So let's look at an example. So let's say we have this C language where we want to allow local variables. So we have a function foo, we have an integer x, so what's the scope of x? Yeah, just inside the body of function foo. Then we have a local function bar, and that has a local function baz. And bar increments x, sets so x equal to x plus one, and then it says if x is less than 10, call bar. So can it do this? Is the function bar, what's the scope of the function bar? Yeah, bar is valid, well, essentially from here to the end of foo. Yes. What about inside its own function body? Yeah, that's how we get recursive functions, right? Functions can call themselves, actually, well, we'll see foreshadowing a little bit when we get to lambda calculus. That's not, you don't actually need to have a name in order to do recursion, but here this is an easy way for us to do recursion. The function name bar is applicable inside of its body, and so it can call itself. Therefore, any functions that are defined inside baz can call themselves. So what x is this changing? There's only one x. There's only one x. And we know, so we're going to go, it's static scoping. So we're talking static scoping here. So this x is going to map to this declaration of x here. So bar, the very first thing it does is call baz. That's all it does. And foo sets x to be 0, calls bar, and then prints out the value of x. So what would be the value of x? So we call bar. What does bar, the first thing bar do? Calls bads. Calls bads. So what does bads do? Increment x, so x is 1. Is x less than 10? Yes, call bar. 
We call Bar. What's the next thing that happens? We call Baz. The first thing it does is increment x equal to 2. So x is now 2. Is x less than 10? Yes. Call Bar. What's the first thing Bar does? Call Baz. So increment x is 3. So it's going to keep going until x is less than 10. So when this is false, so that will be x is equal to 10. And so when it returns, when all these bads is returned, what happens after them? In, in this bar. This bar returns, which will return here. This will return from this bad here. This will return from this bar, and so on and so forth. All the way down to here, we'll finally get out of this one, and we'll have a printf, and we'll print out the value 10. So if we were to compile this with a magic version of DCC that supported local functions, it should print out 10. So how did we deal with accessing local variables inside of a function? What was that? So how did normally, before we had local variables, how would we access this variable x when we set x equal to 0? So for global variables, we gave them a fixed memory location. For local variables, what do we give them? Close. An off fixed offset from the base pointer, right, into our function frame. Our function frame must contain this variable x at a fixed offset. But now what happens when we call this local function bar, right? We're calling a function, so we have to add another function frame. But then that calls another function, and then it needs to access variable x. But whose function frame is variable x in? Foo. So how can it do that? Can it calculate the fixed offset and says, OK, I know there'll be this many function frames before me. So from my base pointer, calculate. Let's look at the problem. So can what we, what we used with CDECL, can, this actually, can that support local functions? Well, probably not. Why? So the problem is here, right? We have foo, then we call bar, and then that calls baz, which then we go inside baz, and now we set x. The problem is this x is inside foo, right? In the C decal calling convention, all we have is our local variables, right? And the parameters to our function. We can access global variables and our local variables. But the problem is that here we are in Baz, and we essentially need to walk up two calls on the function chain to get to x because x is in foo. But the question is, is this a fixed? Could we walk up just twice? Because we do have, remember, we saved our previous function frame's base pointer. So we have bar's base pointer. We could follow that. And then from there, we could find the base pointer to foo. And then from there, we can use the offset. So would that work? But then we have to come back to the uh, to bar function. Then how do we know the address of bar? So we know the previous address. We know we have bar's base pointer, right? Saved on our stack is bar's base pointer. We can just access it, right? It's on the stack. We could read it. So now we know where its base pointer is. We don't put it as our base pointer. We treat it as a variable. So we say this is that base pointer, and then we know eight bytes or four bytes above that is going to be bars function callers save base pointer. And so we can get that. And then we say, aha, at, at, at offset, what's it going to be? Plus 4 is going to be x. And we can use that to access x. What's the problem with that? Will that work here? Yeah. yeah. We could do it. We have all the information. So what happens now, now we say x is less than 10, we call bar, we put a bar on the stack, but when we call baz again, 
and now we need to access x. Now how many function frames is x up the stack? One, two, three, four. Yeah, four or five, depending on how you count. I think five. Right? So now, before we only had to go up two, but now we have to go up four. And the problem is that how do we know which one to go up? So really what we'd like and the way we get around this is the base pointers here store the function that called you's base pointer. Right? So this means that function bar called function baz. Right? That's the way to read this stack of function frames. And function bar was called by baz, and baz was called by bar, and bar was finally called by foo. So all of these links only give us the calling structure, these base pointers. What we really want, but what is this scope decided by? Is the scope of what is x, is that decided by the call structure? What's it decided by? The brackets. The scope, yeah, the brackets, right? The scoping rules. So instead of this, what if we passed in when we call the function its parent's base frame, its parent, its static parent's base frame, its parent scope's base frame. So for Baz, that would be bar, and bar would get passed in foo's base frame. And in this way, we can add what we call an access link. So this would give us a way to access our static parent's scope rather than the person who called us scope. So, we'd have to change our calling convention. So this is why this is tricky, right? This is a language feature that we're like, yeah, this should be, you know, this is something, well, I guess I didn't start with that, but do you think that local functions would be useful? Or do they just make for complicated questions that I can ask you? Both. It's one of those things, I don't know if you ever uh, heard this term, it's called what do they call it? Blurb? Basically the idea is it's very hard to think about how useful a programming language feature is until you've actually coded in that language. And then once you start thinking in that feature, then you go back and go, oh man, how could I ever code in Java that doesn't have these you know, local functions or whatever. Um, so there's this idea that it's actually hard to actually understand. Like I could try to tell you how cool macro programming is in Lisp and how they give you all these awesome metaprogramming benefits, but you'll just look at me like I'm crazy and so you actually took the time to do something in it and saw the benefits for yourself. And then you look at other languages and go, man, this is garbage, why can't I do this cool stuff? So, but we can see here, even if this was a feature that we wanted, it's actually difficult to implement, right? We need to change, fundamentally change the calling convention because each function does not have enough information to support this. So, we could do this. We could add an access link, and a function can follow the access link to find the correct lexical scope for all the variables. And so, if we were here, we would see that Baz would have, so Baz's parent lexical scope is what? Bar. And bar's parent lexical scope is what? Foo. So we know, statically we know x is in whose function scope? Foo. So how many access links do we have to travel up to get to x's function frame? Two. And there it doesn't matter. As long as Baz has its parent function frame for the access link and bar has its parent, then it doesn't matter how many times and how far down the call stack we are, we can always get back up with two jumps up the access link. So I'm going to put this on the left. So Baz would have bar, and bar would then have an access link up to foo. So now we can hard code this, right? We can say follow this link twice, and then x will be at a fixed offset from that second value, no matter how deep our call stack is. So, you know, this Baz will have a pointer to this bar, and that bar will have a pointer to foo. And it's going to be all the way down. We have all this crazy call stack, right? We have each of the frame, saved frame pointers points up the call stack. And we will also have our access links that point, everyone points to their lexical parent. So it looks something like this. Cool. If, 
if there was x declared inside bar if there was an x declared inside bar then we would only so every reference to x would just travel up one access so, lane so, uh, when we reach here scoping rules have already been applied yes because the scoping is happening statically right this is at runtime how do you reach that variable that you know you want so statically, we can tell if there is an int x here for bar, we would say, I know it's one access link up, so follow the access link up one, and this is the offset. Here, I know this x is two, so I can follow two, and so on. So this is done by JavaScript? Kind of. Uh, yeah, so JavaScript, well, I guess I should say this is one way to implement it, but yeah, so this is um, in Java, so part of JavaScript, if you're, not from, if you're not aware or familiar, its scoping rules are not braces, its scoping rules is function levels. And in JavaScript, you can have anonymous functions, which are super awesome. So what people do is to create your own scope when you want your own variables and you don't want them to leak out to other JavaScript, I was gonna say scripts, other JavaScript scripts, what you do is you create an anonymous function, and that way all your variables declared there are local to that function. Set up whatever things, handlers you need, and then you immediately call that function. So you declare the function and call it basically all on one line. And that helps with the lexical scoping. And on JavaScript, you can also do um, like event handlers. This is another way to do event handlers. You can say, when this button is clicked, increment this variable by one. And that variable will be outside the scope of this function. So it does in essence, something similar to this. So this gets into the whole thing of closures, which we're not going to go into here. Um, but you can think it, it lexically looks, it sees what variables it's accessing, and it packages up that information into the function so that when it's called, it can access that variable. Cool. Questions? More questions here? OK. Time for another choose your own education. Do you want to learn about heap memory management or start on Lambda Calculus? I'm confused with left and right. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay. Yeah, one for the first option. Heap. Heap. Okay, now put your hand down. Two for the second option. This is easier. I don't know why you have to do two, but it's just cool. I actually don't know, it's probably about the same. <laughs> so, how do you decide which one you want to do? I kind of do Lambda Calculus, because it's cool. This will give us a lot of time to talk about Lambda Calculus. But just my, my justification would be there's a lot of people that aren't here because they're finishing Project 4. That sucks for them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, as a general consensus, we probably know less about Lambda Calculus than we do about heap memory management. And so, because we're more familiar with that, we go faster. Can you guarantee those students will be here on Wednesday for Lambda no, Calculus? not at all. <laughs> I'm just trying to be altruistic and assert that you care about your students. I do care, but I care about you because you are all here. Are we covering both either way? Yeah, we'll just have like half a lecture less on Lambda Calculus. I mean, the Lambda Calculus can kind of go for as much time as we allow it, so. I see that. All right, we'll do, I'm going to do heat. We're going to do heat. I'll just make executive decision. Because this is cool, low-level stuff. We'll get to as much as we'll get to here. And then we'll uh, do land against this. Because I think we have a lot of time for both. Cool. OK, so we saw different types of memory allocation. We've seen global allocation. How are, how are variables declared and allocated globally? From what? They're put into the static space. Static, yes, I thought you said static. Yes, so the compiler just says, I'm using this much global memory. When you want to load this program, make sure at this specific memory address that you reserve these many bytes, because I will be writing to those bytes. Stack allocation we already saw, right? When we call a new function, we allocate space on the stack for those local variables. And then when that function leaves and returns, we clean up that stack space, so we automatically deallocate it. So now we're going to look at how does the CPU, how does heap allocation actually work? And so for this, somebody didn't write me again, what are the semantics of heap allocation? It starts from low, lower. Address. High level. High level semantics. 
semantics. You, the programmer. It's dynamic to the annotated, then what you require. Yes. So you, as the programmer, what do you have to do? Malloc. You have to explicitly ask for it by using a malloc or one of their family of functions. And when you're done, what do you have to do? Free. Free. You have to call free. Right? So that's the big difference here. Global, you don't have to do anything. Stack, you don't have to do anything. But heap allocation, you're saying, hey, I need some memory, and I will be responsible for freeing it when I'm done. So, OK. So the C heap allocation, it's defined in libc. So this is actually a library function. It's not part of the C language itself. And it's defined in standard lib.h, the malloc functions. So we have malloc, what's calloc? So we actually use this, I think, in the project four code. Does anybody know what it does? Yeah. I don't know. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, I think it's the zeros everything out part. I think you can also. It's a different style. You don't directly ask for bytes, I think. You ask for number of objects and then how many you want. Yeah. And then you have something that you initialize it to. So, or it does it automatically do zero? I think it automatically does zero. Right, so this is nice if you have structures with pointers, because you know those structures, those pointers will be null when you call C alloc. Right? What is realloc? Extending the already allocated memory. Yeah, so this is you telling the heap the memory system, hey, I know I asked for 50 bytes, but now I need 100 bytes. Give me back a new pointer that changes this, what used to be 50 bytes, give me space for 100 bytes, and copy the previous 50 bytes over to that new memory location. So this is how you should be doing, I should find some way to enforce this in the future on projects mm. two and three. This is how you do dynamically expanding arrays in C, in C++. Or not C++ necessarily, but in C, right? Instead of hard coding the size of your arrays, you set a value, you check the length, and when you want to add more, you can double it and use realloc to ask for more memory. Cool. Free, free returns to memory and says, hey, I'm no longer using this. So the very cool thing that these are defined in the C standard library means that there are many different heap allocations many different algorithms for how you manage and how you return heat. You can actually write your own heat management if you want to. It's actually pretty cool. And you can go read that source code. It's not part of the operating system. It's part of the library. Um, so it's really cool. So this actually um, enables you to do cool stuff if you're ever in like an embedded systems environment where you need, you have specific heat requirements. You can use your own version of malloc and free. Let's look at a program. So we have an int, we have our main function, we have a test pointer, i. Uh, we have, we're passing in as argv1. Argv1 is the first argument on the command line. We're calling atoi, what does that do? ASCII to int, that's how you remember it, atoi. So it's gonna parse the string. Remember, argv is gonna deallocate it, so it's gonna be a character pointer, so it's gonna take a string and return the integer value. Then we're going to, from i equals 0 to i less than 10, we're going to malloc that size that we pass in of memory. And then we're going to print out, as a pointer, what was that memory that it gave us. And then return 0. So this is kind of our way of black box testing and trying to reverse engineer the malloc library. Because we're saying, hey, show us. Give us, show us the pointers that you're actually returning. It yes. Creates junk, right? Or garbage. Mm -hmm. When the test goes out of scope, we lose all reference to that. Yes. Yes. Um, the other way to think about it is when test goes out of scope, the program ends. So we don't really care. Right. But, uh, I guess the garbage is only for when your process, your program is running. Right. As soon as your program terminates, everything, all memory that was allocated to your program goes away. So yeah, for a long running process, this is where uh, garbage really comes into play. For a long running process, a desktop application, a web server, any kind of server type application, if it's accumulating garbage over time, it will crash. Okay, so we can compile this with uh, 32. 
So we're saying we want 32 bytes. Uh, so we can compile this with four. So we're asking malloc to give us four bytes. So what is the other guarantee that malloc needs to give us when it returns us four bytes? What do we think should be true about these pointers? Does that have to be true? What must be true? You can dereference them. You can dereference them. So it has to be memory that we can actually access. What else? I guess unless, if you read the man page of malloc, it'll say, except that malloc will return null if it cannot allocate any more memory. So in that case, you couldn't dereference it, but you can check for null. We're not doing that here. What else? Yes, why four bytes apart? Yes, we cannot have overlapping buffers, right? If we go back to even the box circle diagram, when we called malloc, we assumed we got a brand new box with a new value inside of it, and that writing to one of those boxes doesn't change any of the other boxes. If they were overlapping, we'd have to worry about that, right? So. This is part of the thing. If you're trying to reverse engineer or understand how something's written, before you run it, you want to understand what are my assumptions, right? My assumptions are if I'm running this with size four, these pointers better be at least four bytes apart. If they're less than that, then something has gone horribly wrong. So on one run of this, it was uh, 804A008, 804A018. How far apart is that? 16 bytes. Is it overlapping? No. Is it more? Yeah, it's kind of cool. Or interesting. 28, 38, 48, 58, 68, 78, 88, 98. All right? Yeah. So because they're not consecutive in the sense that they're four bytes apart, we would only be able to use technically be allowed to use four bytes starting at that offset. Yes. We're not guaranteed that if we write beyond that, that yes. that's not going to get overwritten. We're peeking under the hood into the heap. Yes, for your program to be semantically correct, you can only write to the four bytes of that pointer. If you ever write to the fifth byte, you could uh, A, have some random crashes, B, it can actually be a security vulnerability. So you need to be very careful, just like buffer overflows allow you to control the execution heap overflows is another type of vulnerability that can allow you to control program execution. Uh, it's a lot more hard, it's more difficult to actually accomplish, but it's definitely possible. So yeah, you don't want to use this as like, oh, I'm asking for four, but it's giving me 16, right? That's, you know, we'll see that that will, that's problems. Cool, so then we want eight bytes. So we look, A008, 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, 68, 78, 88, right? 98, so now let's go more, 24. So we said it's like six, giving us 16, so what if we ask for more than 16? Uh, 08, 28, so now how much is it doing? 32, so it looks like it's trying to four byte align the memory that it gives us, that's interesting. 4096, right, we'll go really big. So this is a lot. <laughs> I can't do the hex math in my head. What would it be? It'd be, no, it's not, it's not exact, what is it? Two. So we have like a hex calculator there. Now I'm curious. Let's see, B010 minus A008, 4104. Interesting. So it's bigger than 4096, right? Huge number. D7 FEC008, so the first one works. The second one works, the third one works, the fourth one works, the fifth one works, until it finally outputs zero, it out returns null because we've allocated all the memory that we can to this program. It returns null twice. 
can't remember what exactly this value is. Anybody know off the top of their hand? One, F, 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 F. I don't remember how many bytes. Oh, that's half a gigabyte. So okay. we, we're allocating half a gigabyte. So we actually got, let's see, one, two, three, 3.5 gigabytes. That's pretty good. And we could actually use this, right? And my machine doesn't have to have 32 gigabytes. If you want to know why that is the case, take operating systems and pay attention to that class. <laughs> Okay, so how does the heap work? So, as we saw, the way that we've drawn a stack, so the stack starts at high memory locations and grows down, right? If you think about it, so we have this process space. So we have all of our memory from all the way, one, 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 32 bytes, bits of one, right? All the way down to all zeros. And our program thinks it's using all that memory, right? As we know, it's not actually the case, but it thinks it's using all that memory. So we have this stack that's growing down. So we have a heap that we also want to grow. So where would we want to put that heap? At the bottom to grow up, right? Doesn't make sense to put it like growing down because there's only a fixed amount of heap you could ever use. You may not use the stack, you may use the heap more, right? And so the program can deal with that. So the heap actually exists in lower memory addresses and grows up. So stack grows down, heap grows up. That's the way to think about it. There's also a ton of other stuff here that we're not talking about. There's the code. The program's code has to live somewhere. The static variables that we talked about, the global variables have to live somewhere. But we're going to ignore those for now. Yeah. How do we check for stack overflow here? Because when when operating system knows that stack is over and now it starts? Uh, it knows. <laughs> um, is the short, very, very short answer. Um, and it, it really, actually, that is the truth. It knows exactly how much, so as we'll see kind of how this works, but it precisely allocates and it knows, okay, here's your stack, it goes from here to here, you have this many bytes. Um, as we'll see, the heap you actually request to the operating system to get more memory. So we'll look at this in a second. So, right, yes? Uh, so let's say if you allocate 10 variables in a heap. Yes. And if we allocate the first to one. Ah, we'll see. Yeah. So, the heap is a libc construct, right? Free and malloc calls libc, but where does that memory actually come from? Right? That's the important thing is malloc and free are calling a library function, but it has to actually get memory from somewhere. So SBRK is the Linux system call to increase the size of the heap. And this tells the OS, hey, I need more heap space. So this is kind of cool because you don't have to worry about this. This is why we have cool libraries. Uh, but it's defined here, you can call this and so malloc doesn't actually allocate new heap directly, but calls sbreak to ask the OS to increase the heap allocation. And this is the primitive that all of this is based off of. So we can look at this function. We can actually do this ourselves. We can uh, get size. We can call test malloc size. We can ask for the current sbreak. So an sbreak with zero will return the current, where the current heap is located, the top of the heap according to the, the OS. And then we can print out these values. So we can see, if we run this with four, we can see that the program has actually been allocated up till 806B000. And so you can think that malloc is being a little bit smart here in that it's asking for a lot from the OS and just using a little bit of it so it doesn't have to keep calling a system call every time you ask for memory. Right, so you can think of it's caching some space for you. We can increase the size and now we can see that it's all within that size. Here are 1024. We can crank that up to 4096, which the very first time we do that, it'll ask for, let's see, more. So 6C00, so it asked for more memory and just gave it to us. We can ask for 65536, and it'll ask for a lot. But we can see here that in between these calls, it had to ask for more memory from the OS. So this is kind of another cool way that we can debug uh, and look at this. 
So, malloc calls sbreak to request more heap memory from the OS. The question is, is how is the memory deallocated when we call free? Right? So if you think about it, it seems like malloc is incredibly simple, right? Just, yeah, call sbreak, get more free memory, and give it to the program. The tricky part comes in is the programmer gives us what when we call free? A pointer. It's just an address, right? It just contains an address. How do we know if we should free that? Maybe that was memory that we would never allocate. What if they accidentally pass a pointer to the heap? Should we free that? No, probably not, right? That'd be bad. So now we can do our test again, and this time free the pointer before we call it again. And so we can see running this on four. This is actually kind of a cool thing. So we keep getting the same pointer back, right? And this makes sense, and this matches with our semantics of what memory management should do, right? Keep allocation should not change what's given on the stack. Uh, so we can reuse that address, right? As soon as we call free, that memory is good to be reused. Uh, same thing, I think the same thing should happen. Oh, so now we can only free half of the calls. Right, so let's free half of the pointers. So we can see it's reusing it, every other one, right? So, we have malloc, malloc takes in a size and returns a pointer, free takes in a pointer. So how would you, so, okay, I normally go into, I wanna finish this today. So we got three minutes, cool. Um, so we know that malloc has to call s, s break to increase the size of the heap, right? And it needs to return the pointer that s break returns. Free needs to, could essentially set s break to the negative allocated size. Uh, da, da, da. Ah, okay, so part of the problem is when you call free, you just have a pointer to memory. And we told the programmer, hey, how many bytes you call for the size that's how many bytes you can overwrite. So when we call free, how many bytes are we, we supposed to free? The size, but they gave that to us in the call to malloc. Right, so where do we put that? So it's really cool, what actually happens is what you do is you allocate the size that they gave you plus extra bytes for your housekeeping information. You use those extra bytes at the front to store the size of the memory that was allocated, and then you return a pointer inside that memory, so that when they call free, you get that pointer, you decrease it by that many bytes, and now you can access the size and you know exactly how much to free. Um, yeah, it's actually really cool. So this is ripped from the actual source code to malloc. So you can go in there, it's pretty complicated, but um, it basically looks like this. So it stores the chunk size and the buffer. Okay, no, this is my version, because this is a super simple one. And so your code could say, hey, give me new memory, call sbreak with the size of a malloc chunk plus the size that you gave me, right? Because I want to store the chunk size, and I'm going to set the chunk size to be whatever that new size you gave me, and I'm going to return a pointer starting at this new memory and offsets into this buffer to point right at this buffer. So it's kind of crazy. If you look back, you'll see a, there's a bunch of metadata there. And so free would be very easy in that you take the pointer that they give them, you go back the size of a size t, so that would give you back to the start, and you use a cast to say, hey, this is a structure that's a malloc chunk, and now you can access the size. So, where am I going here? And so this would, you could allocate it, free it, all that cool stuff. Okay. Ah, so part of the problem with the heap is we've allocated a bunch, we've stored a bunch, right? We have no control over when the programmer is going to free memory, right? They could say, okay, let's use this. Ah, sorry, my explanation. Okay. So what we do is we keep the heap and we store metadata that says 
what's free and what's being used. So at the start, we'd allocate some memory and we'd say, all of this is free. And then we'd say, okay, the programmer used four bytes, let's split that up. And every chunk will have a pointer to the next chunk. And we'll have a bit that says, this one is not free. So this chunk is not free, and this chunk is free. So then when I need to allocate more memory, I can follow these arrows, I can follow these links. So essentially turning this heap into a linked list. Uh, I think it's technically a doubly linked list. So we could go backwards. Yeah, so we have a pointer from the free to the next bit of memory, and then we need to allocate some. We chunk that piece of memory. And now when we free, we change that, and now we can allocate more, so we'll reuse. So this is what's crazy, is let's say they first allocated 16 bytes, and then freed it, and then only allocated 8 bytes. So now we can reuse this part in here, and only use this 8 bytes. But we have to split up that free range into a used range and a free range, and add more pointers there. Then they could ask for a lot more. So, you probably never thought about it, but the heap is incredibly important, right? If it takes a couple seconds for you to get memory, that's not going to be very good for you. Uh, so, modern malloc is super interesting. Uh, there's all different types of heap workloads. There could be lots of small frequent allocations, so they actually keep different sizes and areas of where they want to allocate memory. So if you ask for four bytes, it's going to come in one area. If you ask for 4K, it's going to come from a different area because they know you're more likely to reuse and free those small chunks. So anyways, I highly, if you're interested in this stuff, I highly recommend you look into this. This is kind of a crash course on heap management.